Hey everyone. So I just concluded our uh, brief discussion of these four principles for ethical research and the ethical frameworks that kind of uh, help us navigate the, the trade-offs between those principles. Uh, and uh, now I just want to talk briefly about uh, areas of difficulty, particularly, uh, you know, with research uh, in the digital age, right? With research involving uh, data collections online and things like that, right? Uh, one uh, really important uh, area of difficulty is the question of informed consent, right? And uh, um, especially from, you know, the perspective of kind of more traditional uh, lab-based or social science research, uh, where, where it was relatively easy to, to, um, to, to collect informed consent from participants, um, uh, there, 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 there's a little bit of a, uh, or, or the kind of the extreme perspective would be that uh, informed cons consent for everything is kind of the, the crucial aspect that, that, uh, that makes, that is ultimately necessary for research to be truly, you know, ethical or, or, or to, to, to fulfill ethical standards. But the problem is realistically that w that doesn't uh, work for a lot of, you know, like to today's uh, or research projects in today's age. Right. And there are potential downsides uh, with this perspective of informed consent for everything. Right. So, for example, uh, you could think of um, cases um, in, in the chapter. I think they discussed the. Um, um, the uh, censorship study, for example, uh, where asking participants to provide informed con consent to, to participate in these studies uh, might actually increase the risks that they face through, you know, prosecution in, uh, you know, in the countries that, that they're residents in, right? Uh, so, so particularly in that censorship study, right? So gathering informed consent ultimately can increase risks, right? Um, but there are other reasons. Uh, gathering informed consent, depending on the study, for example, um, thinking about the uh, emotion, um, uh, the emotional contagion study, uh, fully informed consent before the study uh, begins can also compromise the scientific value of the study because you might want to study something uh, where, you know, if participants are aware that they are being studied or that they are potentially part of, you know, a treatment or control condition uh, might ultimately uh, invalidate your your findings or, or make your treatments less effective and things like that. So it can com compromise your research goals, right? But in addition, or, or in addition to that, there can also be logis logistical uh, limitations, right? So sometimes it is just impractical to obtain informed consent uh, from everyone impacted in your study, particularly when it comes to online uh, uh, data collections, right? However, um, so 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 essentially, that means this this kind of narrative or idea of like informed consent for everything as kind of the 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 guideline or the goal uh, is is certainly not re not reasonable and is not uh, 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 not useful. Um, um, uh, and given that we can't uh, or might not want to uh, um, um, have fully informed consent in every study or b just because we can't have fully informed consent in every study, uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, things to keep in mind or potential solutions or potential you know, mitigation strategies given the fact that we're not able to uh, collect fully informed consent in every particular study, right? Uh, so one of the things uh, are, are these uh, these accountability mechanisms that I, that I mentioned in the previous video, which involves informing the public about the research, right? Uh, about the research projects and about the research uh, procedures. Another potential solution could involve enabling an, uh, 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 or uh, providing an op an uh, and uh, a possibility to opt out of the research, right? So even if there wasn't informed consent, providing a possibility to not uh, 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 fully informed consent, providing a, per, uh, a possibility to not participate uh, and not be, be in the study. Uh, there's also, uh, depending on the context and the specific uh, substantive question, there could also be uh, the uh, the possibility of seeking consent from third parties or other uh, stakeholders uh, instead of uh, participants, 
Um, uh, of course, whenever you don't have uh, informed consent, what you should, wherever it's possible, uh, include a debriefing. So, so ultimately telling participants after the fact uh, that the study was conducted, what the goals were, uh, why certain uh, manipulations uh, were conducted and um, why it was necessary to kind of not include fully informed con consent. Another example, when it comes to these logistical uh, limitations that I mentioned, another solution can be rather than seeking informed consent from every participant that is involved in the study or impacted by the study, uh, for example, seeking consent from a sample of participants, you know, maybe in a, in, in a, in a previous uh, uh, pilot, uh, for example. Um, the second area of difficulty uh, is uh, understanding and managing informational risk. And that is uh, one, one area that is becoming increasingly important, especially since more and more kind of um, records of, uh, you know, website or, or, or online tracing data or, or other types of, you know, large, um, um, uh, large databases are becoming available for research. Uh, this also kind of um, introduces the potential risk of uh, de-identifying uh, information or identifying, um, uh, or not de-identifying, uh, re-identifying uh, people and ultimately um, uh, recovering kind of sensitive information about uh, identified individuals. Um, so, so, so this, so the, the potential harm from the disclosure of information is becoming more and more real as we kind of talk about large scale, big data, uh, um, uh, uh sources, uh, you know, we had examples of, uh, the, the Netflix, um, uh, the Netflix prize where, uh, Netflix published, uh, movie ratings. Uh, and um, people were able to kind of connect those to to for example sexual preferences which which can be you know incredibly sensitive information um, for people and so there are examples where it's not even if it's not immediately obvious that this is one potentially uh, you know re-identifiable or, or or the the ability the possibility exists to kind of match it to public um, uh, records uh, and uh, it might not necessarily be immediately obvious that it can involve um, uh, potentially um, um, sensitive information right and so one of those examples of kind of um, anonymization and uh, the risk of re-identification uh, was this uh, uh, study that was or, or this example of this medical study that was in in, in the bit by bit book uh, where um, where anonymization kind of uh, describes this process of removing obvious identifying information from a data set right so for example we have a data set that includes uh, medical information, but also uh, sex, birth date, zip code, a home address, uh, and name. And of course, like the name and home address are clearly identifying information. And in in, in a lot of cases, kind of the simple view of um, like preserving anonymity would be uh, or or has been in the past to uh, kind of remove those identifiers, remove remove the name and home address. Uh, for example, and then kind of uh, share potential share just like the the an anonymous uh, data source, right? But the obvious risk is that there is a lot of other public records available that you can match uh, to the original uh, records, right? So uh, in this uh, case, we had uh, the anim uh, anonymized medical records uh, that still included zip code, birth date, and sex. And as soon as you have something. Uh, you know, local information in the U.S. like voting records uh, that include information like the name, home address, uh, party, uh, and uh, date of registration for that uh, uh, or for to vote, um, um, but also include kind of zip code, birth date, and sex, right? And so, oftentimes that can be enough. Uh, uh, that the, the combination of zip code, birth date, and sex can be uh, unique enough to match the anonymous medical records with the voting records and thereby uh, re-identify uh, 
observations in that data set, right? So, so this is just one example where uh, supposedly a data set has been anonymized and then ultimately was it, was be, uh, it was possible to re-identify uh, particular individuals in that data set based on uh, publicly available uh, voting records, right? And this is just, just one example, right? So the guiding principle uh, for researchers here should of course uh, be that all data are potentially identifiable and potentially sensitive. And a lot of research uh, when it comes to kind of differential uh, privacy and, and, and making sure that these shared data sets are not re-identifiable, uh, uh, there's a lot of research that kind of uh, focuses on, on that aspect, right? And of course we kind of, again, are facing a trade-off. I mentioned earlier that we have this incentive ultimately uh, if we want to maximize the benefits of, of research projects, we also want to share the data with other researchers so they can make use of it and that ultimately increases you know, overall knowledge. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, completely uh, releasing all data, all available data uh, um, can risk uh, ultimately um, revealing uh, uh, sensitive, uh, potentially sensitive information, especially when it can be matched with other uh, publicly available records, right? Uh, so these are things that need to be kept in mind when we talk about things like data sharing uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, um, and how to kind of, to what extent uh, uh, we should make, uh, you know, uh, data sets uh, directly available uh, to everyone or to what extent there should be you know, institutions like uh, data protection plans or uh, kind of requirements to follow data protection guidelines if you're uh, uh, in order to get access to the data and things like that need to be in place uh, to prevent uh, this um, uh, informational risk or, or uh, the pot potentially uh, or, or minimize the risk of re-identification ultimately, right? Um, so uh, related to that is of course the uh, this this issue of privacy uh, and uh, uh, privacy of course is is, is uh, sometimes a little bit difficult to to clearly uh, pin down as a concept uh, but the way we are thinking about this is uh, to think about privacy uh, as the right to so, so not necessarily as kind of the right to secrecy or the right to kind of controlling your information, uh, but rather thinking about it as a right to appropriate flow of personal information. And this is where this uh, um, concept of contextual integrity comes in. And what we mean by contextual uh, integrity uh, is that, um, uh, that uh, information or information flow should be appropriate given the specific context of the information. And that con that uh, um, ultimately depends on a couple of parameters, uh, right? Um, uh, that, that are kind of a part of this uh, information flow. Uh, one is the, the actors, so who, uh, the, who the, 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 the subject and the sender and the recipients of, of the information, um, uh, the, types of information and of course the the transmission principles or the constraints under which the information uh, flows right and so when it, when we're talking about uh, privacy value uh, uh, or uh, um, um, when we're talking about kind of the issue of um, 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 privacy um, being violated uh, what we mean usually is that information uh, uh, flow was inappropriate given the nature or given kind of the expectations of the person uh, uh, whose information has flown from uh, one sender uh, from from a sender to a recipient, right? Um, so, for example, going back to uh, voting records, right? Voting records are public, right? They're in that sense, they're not necessarily private. Uh, uh, they're not private information. You can, you know, just pay uh, or, or, you know, uh, you pay, uh, I don't know, $50 to get voting records for, for 
uh, a specific region, right? And that includes, uh, you know, identifying information. So that's not private. Uh, but at the same time, if you start, I don't know, sending that information uh, to your to a neighborhood um, and identifying people uh, based on their party um, affiliation, that would be information flow that is not necessarily appropriate because it's not necessarily kind of expected uh, by uh, the people whose whose data is, uh, is ultimately affected, right? So this is kind of how we think about uh, privacy uh, in the context of contextual integrity, right? Um, um, all right. So uh, lastly, another important uh, aspect or an important area of uh, difficulty is uh, making decisions in the face of uncertainty. And of course, uh, you know, these risks and these uh, kind of benefits in research projects uh, always involve uncertainty, right? We don't, we oftentimes don't really know exactly what the risks are and how likely it is that certain uh, risks uh, or that, that certain um, uh, harms, uh, you know, potential harm might materialize and how, you know, uh, severe that harm might be. And here the guiding principles, of course, should be to minim, uh, to uh, minimize uh, uh, the risk, but also when thinking about the potential risk, also thinking about, for example, with uh, in the context of um, um, in the context of um, um, field experiments uh, that that can involve a large number of part or uh, participants or subjects um, uh, that we, to the extent that there is potential harm also be careful about how many people we need to include uh, in a study in order to you know have a valid uh, um, a statistical inference and not to uh, run into an issue or create too much risk and potential harm by including too many people in your study too many participants in your study or more than you need in order to kind of make valid statistical inferences about the causal mechanism that you're trying to identify right so while in the past when we're thinking about power analysis oftentimes power analysis were done to kind of know how many like what the minimum size uh, sample sizes that you need in order to identify your effect uh, in 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 these cases, when it comes to these kind of risk analysis and minimizing the risk, uh, it kind of introduces this issue of overpowering a study and involving too many or potentially involving too many subjects, uh, and thereby increasing uh, and unnecessarily increasing the number of people uh, that are potentially exposed uh, to to an unnecessary risk. Okay. Uh, and then uh, lastly, um, uh, three um, um, uh, practical tips for ethical research that, that kind of conclude that chapter uh, uh, in the bit by bit book, uh, which I think are, are good to keep in mind. Uh, the first one is uh, the RB is a floor and not a ceiling. Uh, and, uh, and so what that implies is that of course uh, the RB rules have to be followed. Uh, you know, those are the guidelines, but that's, you know, Filling out an RB application before you run your study is not is that that's not the end of you thinking about the ethical implications of your research, right? Um, filling out the forms is not uh, enough. Ultimately, uh, it's important to kind of uh, think about think more deeply about ethical implications, and you know, for example, considering uh, including things like an ethical appendix and and really t thinking deeply about uh, potential ethical. Uh, trade-offs and implications beyond what is required from the IRB. Uh, whenever you evaluate your study and evaluate the design and the ethical implications uh, of the design, always try to imagine how participants and stakeholders uh, uh, who are, you know, effect potentially uh, impacted by the research uh, might react to the study, uh, or how you yourself, if you were in their position, would would uh, would uh, think about that study. Um, and then uh, lastly, what is, what is, what is also important uh, is to think about research uh, ethics not as a kind of a dichotomy between like this is an ethical study and this is a non-ethical uh, study, but rather think about it in a kind of uh, on a continuous scale uh, where even if a study is kind of considered ethical, uh, you should still strive for 
you know, uh, an even better ethical ba balance, so to speak, right? So, so think of eth research ethics as continuous and not discrete, uh, just a, a, a dichotomy. Uh, all right, so that's all about uh, ethical research for now. We'll talk more about this in our Q&A session this week. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to that discussion and uh, we'll, we'll discuss more uh, about this in uh, the last two assignments as well.